This is chapter 22. It says evidence of evolution. This is from a different textbook. However, it does correspond with our textbook, chapter 22, called Descent with Modification, Our Dar a Darwinian View of Life. So we'll proceed just like we did last time, where I'll have the PowerPoint slides on the right, and then the notes on the left, and you'll fill out yours. Now, since Darwin's time, the evidence for evolution has really become overwhelming, and it's quite amazing that he was able to observe as much as he did, given the lack of technology. Since then, there have been two ma major foundations of evidence. First, natural selection produces evolutionary change, and fossil, the fossil record shows the history of evolutionary change. It shows us how organisms have changed over time. Beyond that, quite a bit of supportive evidence is drawn from various fields of the biological sciences, anatomy, molecular biology, and even biogeography. So here are the topics we'll talk about. Darwin's finches and their beaks, peppered moths and the idea of industrial melanism, artificial selection, the fossil record, the evolutionary history of horses, very interesting, the anatomical record, the molecular record, convergent and divergent evolution, and of course critics of Darwin. So let's begin with the beaks of Darwin's finches. Quite a famous story, of course. This is just one of the most classic examples of evolution by the process of natural selection. When we say evolution by natural selection, make sure that you understand that evolution is basically the outcome, the change that we see, and natural selection is the process that got you there. <clears throat> While in the Galapagos in 1835, Darwin collected 31 specimens of finches, specifically on the Santa Cruz Island. At first, he thought he just had different types of birds, maybe different species, like wrens, grosbeaks, blackbirds. But then, he brought his specimens to John Gould. And you might remember watching the movie Darwin's Dangerous Idea in Biology, a very long British movie, and where his specimens were observed by another scientist, an ornithologist to somebody who studies birds. And John Gould determined that these birds were basically a closely related group of distinct species, just differing in their bills, but otherwise the same. And now, 14 species have been identified from that collection. A group of ground finches that had larger bills that could crush seeds, like seen here. Sharp, and they had uh, sharp-beaked ground finches that <clears throat> could actually consume blood from seabirds. Interesting. A lot of tree and warbler finches with smaller bills eating insects. And even a tree finch with a parrot-like bill that would eat buds and fruits, seen here. And a woodpecker finch that uses cactus spines to actually probe for insects. Very interesting using a tool, seen here. So this knowledge led Darwin to surmise that these species had actually arisen from the process of natural selection. In a quote from Darwin, Seeing this graduation and diversity of structure in one small, intimately related group of birds, one might really fancy that from an original paucity of birds in this archipelago, one species has been taken and modified for different ends. So in other words, from one species of bird, that's the paucity, having very little, in the archipelago is this chain of violence, basically, that, when given the opportunity, has changed over time to give rise to several different species of birds that all feed in different ways. So he basically was suggesting that the adaptation to different food sources led to the evolution of these different beaks. Form and function, right? So take a minute, maybe pause, and take a look at this picture and look at the different beak shapes of these different birds, what category of finch they're in, what their bill does, and what they eat. <clears throat> well, that certainly makes sense, but did you know that this has actually been tested in modern times? So remember that evolution by natural selection occurs if there has to be variation in the population, the variation has to lead to differences among the individuals in their survival and their reproductive success. And of course, the variation has to be genetically based. It has to be heritable, otherwise it wouldn't be passed on. Beginning in the 70s, 
Peter and Rosemary Grant studied the med medium ground finch on Daphne Major in the Galapagos. And that's this guy right here. Now, <clears throat> what they would do is they would measure the beak depth annually, and they noticed that there was variation within the population. Some were deeper than others. These birds feed preferentially on small, tender seeds, and we see this in the wet years because there are, there are lots of these seeds in wet years, of course. Secondarily, if they have to, they'll feed on larger, drier seeds, which are more predominant in the dry years. That probably makes sense. So they measured their beak depth annually, and the average beak depth changed predictably with moisture. So for example, in the dry years, the birds with the greater beak depth were better able to survive. In the subsequent year, the average beak depth increased because if those that had the deeper beak were more successful, the next year you would see more of them in the population because they were more successful in feeding and therefore in reproduction. They also measured the beak depth of parents with respect to their offspring's beak depth to make sure that there was a heritable factor. And that's shown right here. So among Darwin's finches, natural selection adjusts the beak of the, the shape of the beak in response to the nature and availability of food supply. Such adjustments can be seen to occur at, even today. Let's look at another example. Peppered moths. <clears throat> This is another classic example of evolution that's been observed in nature during a human's lifetime. Peppered moths and industrial melanism. This is a classical example of a new trait being favored in a changing environment. The peppered moth, shown here, have variable color patterns in nature from light gray to black. Here's the light gray one. Depending on which set of pigments they received, so when they're black speckling, they're peppered. If they're jet black, they're melanic. The color is genetically based, and they have multiple alleles for just the one gene. Black is dominant, but was once rare. It actually increased in frequency during and with the Industrial Revolution, which of course caused pollution to come up. Pollution was not only darkening the tree bark, but actually killing the light-colored lichens that covered it. So in looking at the selection for melanism, in 1896, Tut first proposed a hypothesis to explain the decline of the light-colored moths, and it was generally accepted. He said that peppered moths are more visible to the bird predators on darker trees. So as the trees became darker with the pollution, then the lighter-colored moths stood out and were picked off by birds. Makes sense. In the 1950s, Kettlewell actually tested the hypothesis with a mark and recapture study. And what he did was he marked the moths with a dot on the underside of their wings. He released equal numbers of marked dark and light moths into two environments, non-polluted and polluted. The recaptured moths from these areas and tabulated types are as follows. Birmingham, and this is in England, a polluted area, he recovered 19% light moths and 40% dark moths. Obviously, he didn't recover everything. In Dorset, the non-polluted or cleaner area, he recovered 12.5% light moths and only 6% dark moths. He also filmed the birds hunting in these areas, noting that sometimes birds passed right over the, bird, the moths that were camouflaged. Kettlewell's results have been corroborated by eight separate field studies whose methods have been improved, and the results are all the same. Corroborated, corroborated basically means that they all found the same thing. Natural selection leads to evolution, and birds, the predators, provide the major agent of selection. So they are the actual driving force, if you will. So Kettlewell, his study basically supported Tut's hypothesis back in 1896. And here are the pictures of the moths again. So what is industrial melanism? It's an evolutionary process by which darker individuals come to predominate over lighter individuals due to natural selection. 
We see similar results in other moth species found in industrialized areas around the world, Eurasia and even North America. Now we even see the reversal of melanism, selection against the melanic allele. Remember, that's the dark one. So let's talk about that. We see widespread governmental <clears throat> pollution controls that were implemented in the second half of the 20th century. The Clean Air Act in England in 1956 and the American Clean Air Act in 1963. The impacts of these laws showed up in the peppered moths as the air became clean. In England, in Caldy Common, outside Liverpool, in 1959, 93% of their moths were dark moths. And look, and 36 years later, 15% of the moths were dark moths. So notice the decline. This actually correlates with a drop in pollutants such as sulfur dioxide and suspended particulates. In Detroit, we see a similar pattern. In 1959, 89% dark moths. 1994, 15% dark moths. So as the air and surfaces became cleaner, the moths tended back to their normal coloration pattern. <clears throat> now there's been some reconsideration of the actual agent of natural selection. So though this appears to be a clear case for natural selection, Tet's hypothesis regarding the agent of selection, meaning what's driving it, is being evaluated. There is not a direct correlation between the frequency of light-colored moths with the presence of lichen. For example, the light-colored moths in Caldy Common began to increase in frequency long before the lichen did. And the lichen population in, on the trees in Detroit never really changed much in the last 30 years. So perhaps the, the background of the lichen is not that important. Peppered moths couldn't even be found on trees in Detroit at all, regardless of lichen presence. Are they resting somewhere else? Maybe the treetops? Is the pollution poisoning the selective agent rather than predation? Perhaps, but only the bird population is backed with experimental evidence. That's the only thing we have evidence for. Maybe the lichen have nothing to do with the moth predation, but just the fact that the pollution covers everything with soot, this is darkening the bark. This is supposed to say bark. There we go. Regardless of the uncertainty over the agent of selection, it's obvious that the frequency of melanism correlates with the level of pollution and still provides a very classic example of evolution by natural selection. So the point here is that natural selection has favored the dark form of the peppered moth in areas subject to severe air pollution, perhaps because on darkened trees they're less easily seen by moth-eating birds. Selection has in turn favored the light form as pollution pollution has abated or gone away. So I'm going to stop there and you'll see a few more installments of this lecture.